Absolutely. So, um, Judith Altry isn't here, so I'm going to call upon Al Jenkins, please, to say grace. Thank you, Al. For what we are about to receive, the Lord makes us truly thankful. Amen. Amen. And I've asked everybody to bring water in because we have a toast to Her Majesty the Queen. The Queen. The Queen. The Queen. The Queen. The Queen. And sailors everywhere. And also a toast to the gentleman we're celebrating today. George Cuthbertson. Uh, George, George, George. Uh, life well lived. Life, 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 life well lived. Welcome, everybody. Today is kind of a special day. We've done it a little backwards to what we normally do. We thought that we would uh, handle today like a normal Shellbacks meeting. So those of you who haven't been before will have some sense of the kinds of things that George experienced when he came to Shellbacks. We normally sit down for a meal after the bell goes and we don't move from one room to another. So, welcome to all of you. I'm delighted to see you here celebrating such a good man. We start by singing a shanty. And today the shanty will be Sally Brown. We don't have enough hymn books for everybody, but on page seven, and I welcome up any skippers and guests who would like to join me at the front. Um, Mr. Mazza, come on. Oh, yeah, good. Oh, Richard, yes. to those of you who have never been to Shellback before. And now, I'd just like to tell you about a little bit about Rob Mazza, who is the instigator of this event. He was to have spoken about the model room today, and he called me and said, Diane, I wonder if we could do a tribute to George. And so, it has happened. Rob is a mechanical engineer and a naval architect with over 40 years in the marine industry. He began as a yacht designer with CNC Yachts and Mark Ellis Design in Canada and Hunter Marine in the US. He moved to the sales and marketing of structural cores and bonding compounds with ATC Chemicals in Ontario. 
And he's done spent a lot of time in his semi-retired state uh, as a contributing editor to the good old boat magazine and professional builder and wooden boat magazines. He sits on the board of directors for the Marine Museum of the Great Lakes in Kingston and is vice commodore of the Royal Hamilton Yacht Club. He continues to follow his interest in history on yachting. And today he will tell you of the history of George Cutherson. Rob. Thanks, Diane. And uh, thank you, Shellbacks, for allowing us to uh, do this. Uh, George uh, was very close to this group. Uh, he he um, was, did consider himself a Shellbacks, and certainly uh, any time that I spoke at Shellbacks, uh, George, uh, I was fortunate that George was there. Uh, this, as Diane pointed out, started out as a uh, tour of the model room back in 2012, that was indicated by Jim Taylor. And Jim saw this originally as myself and George uh, collaborating uh, on that, uh, on that uh, examination of all the models in the model group. And George was a, a real help to me in putting a lot of that history together and certainly uh, went out of his way to make sure he was there at every presentation. So it did seem, as Diane said, quite fitting that this, this was going to be the culmination of the tour of the model room that, that we should uh, uh, devote this shellbacks to George. And I'd like to thank Helen as well uh, for letting us uh, do this because George himself uh, decreed that there would not be a great deal of fuss uh, after his death. He wanted it to be uh, quite a low-key affair and uh, so I feel privileged uh, that Helen has allowed uh, shellbacks to, uh, to uh, do this uh, as a tribute to George. Um, We, some of us in this room actually had the honor and privilege of uh, attending a family service for George earlier uh, uh, last month. And uh, that event uh, focused on George uh, as a father, grandfather, uh, genealogist, pilot. I didn't know George owned as many aircraft as he did. Uh, and it also touched on his uh, life as a yacht designer. But today, because this is Shellbacks and because it's the Royal Canadian Yacht Club, uh, what we're going to be doing is focusing on George as a yacht designer, <coughs> sailor, uh, yacht builder. Uh, and most people in this room know George in connection with that. And the other amazing thing about George is that how many people he touched. I mean, everything I've achieved in life, uh, you, you, I can lay right at George's doorstep. And I think a lot of people in this room could say that. Uh, he's the one that provided the path for me and many others to follow a career in yacht design uh, when none actually existed uh, at the time in Canada, for sure. And in that regard, there will be a number of people today, and you'll be relieved to know I will not be speaking for the whole hour here. Uh, a number of people are coming forward to express uh, their gratitude and, uh, and indebtedness to George. But before we start, I'm just going to read a portion of the uh, words that I spoke at the family service uh, that sums up, uh, I think, how my life and, uh, and how much I owe to George. And it basically said, it starts saying, I still vividly remember sitting at my desk in residence at Queen's in 1968, reading about Red Jacket's SORC win on the front page of the Globe and Mail. I had already decided when I was 16 years old that I wanted to be a yacht designer. Uh, and I believe it was previous advice from George that sent me into mechanical engineering, the same path that he had taken. It was Sid Matthews who ran the touring tank at NRC in Ottawa who had already put me onto George in the mid-1960s saying he was the only yacht designer in Canada worth his salt. <laughs> so when Rob Ball, Steve Kelly, and I wanted to go into yacht design, we had an obvious path to follow. And that path led directly to George's door and much to our lasting gratitude, he opened it and let us in. 
However, when George himself graduated in 1950, there was no obvious path. He had to find his own way and create a job and an industry that really did not exist in Canada at that time. Remember, the only other Canadian yacht designer practicing in Toronto uh, was TBF Benson, and he died in 1941. And the other yacht designer, Michael Carter, uh, was uh, Bill Rouet, uh, was located in uh, Halifax uh, at that time, was 71 years old, and Halifax uh, from Toronto in 1950 was uh, a world away. So George had no mentors. Uh, there were other local builders like Dick Telford for whom George always retained that lasting affection and respect. George even wrote a letter as a young teenager to L. Francis Herschel, who at that time was writing for Rudder magazine and was thrilled, George was thrilled to receive a written response, which he kept to this day. Herrschaft gave George the age-old advice that if you want to become a yacht designer, first work in a yacht yard, a boat yard, which uh, led George at the age of 14 to apply to J.J. Taylor's, who were building fair miles during the war for the war effort, and he was offered a job. This, I gather, horrified his mother, who instead got him a job as a groundskeeper at the local cemetery, <laughs> which George credits with his continued dislike of all things horticultural. <laughs> so George taught himself how to be a yacht designer, and he single-handedly, with the help of a with, with fatherly patrons, and uh, George considers Norm Walsh a father figure, uh, carved out a profession uh, where none existed before. He did not apprentice with anyone, he started from scratch. However, he was extremely fortunate in his timing. There was an influx of talented immigrants coming to Canada with exceptional skills, and after uh, over 15 years of depression and war, there's a pent-up demand for leisure products, of which sailboats were an important part, not to mention the invention of this thing called fiberglass. Talk about being in the right place, place at the right time. But it was George who brought it all together, and it all started with George. We have an amazing group of people with us today. Uh, I'm really <coughs> pleased and gratified with the turnout we've had. Uh, we originally, what, started with 45, then the, uh, RC, working with RCYC, who I'd like to thank for all the efforts they put in this, we moved it up to 65, then we got up to 80, and then we got up to uh, 120, and now we're up to uh, over 100. Uh, and there are some people I'd like to recognize today, and I'd specifically like to recognize uh, Helen Cuff Cufferson, uh, who uh, made this all happen, and uh, <laughs> And with Helen uh, is her daughter Jill, uh, son Michael, Michael there, uh, wife Roberta, uh, daughters Sarah, Katrina, and Heather here. Uh, Sarah, Sarah, okay. Mm -hmm. I noticed her tag still out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the good news is, uh, actually, talking to Helen a little while ago, uh, we hope to see her at future Shellback uh, presentations as well. Yes. And yeah. Once the Shellback, always a Shellback. <laughs> And the other, there, there are two basically uh, large groups here. The uh, first, of course, is George's fellow Shellback uh, uh, members, uh, all of whom are here to uh, honor George uh, as a Shellback and as a uh, friend. The other large group we have here is about 40 CNC alumni to recognize George uh, for his contributions uh, in the yachting world and the way that he affected their lives as well. Um, I, we have a, a number of speakers this afternoon, uh, and the interesting thing is uh, whoever I asked to speak uh, didn't say no. Everyone was quite keen to uh, speak about George. When we start, when we start uh, John Byrne, Rob Ball, and Steve Killing are here and they will be speaking later, and uh, Doug Hunter and David Howard will be saying a few words as well. And speaking of CNC Yachts, uh, I'd just like to recognize the presence of uh, Mark Bruckman, where is Mark, and uh, Richard Hainerhaller, uh, Richard's there. Uh, their fathers, of course, uh, Eric Bruckman and George Hainerhaller, were instrumental in the founding of CNC Yachts. And Mark, of course, is no stranger to everybody in this room with his work on uh, Pipe Dream, Red Jacket, uh, and Tomahawk. <laughs> the other 
group that is here and representing a, uh, an institution that was very uh, top of mind for George was the uh, Marine Museum of the Great Lakes at Kingston. Uh, George donated all his drawings uh, up till 1973, starting actually with li uh, literally his childhood doodles and uh, all his scrapbooks uh, to the Marine Museum uh, to form the Cutperson Collection. And then uh, Tim Jacket, uh, who inherited all the CNC drawings when Tarpon bought CNC, uh, donated all the CNC drawings from 1973 to I think about 1996. To the museum. So the museum has an extraordinary collection of, uh, of the, what they're now calling the Cutlerson and CNC collection. Uh, Richard Hinterholder actually donated his father's uh, drawings to the museum as well. So the Marine Museum has a, a very extensive yachting history, including going back to TBF uh, Benson, uh, the only collection of TBF drawings, Benson drawings uh, that I know of in the world. So uh, I'd like to recognize the presence of Marina Smith past curator and um, cur past curator emeritus of the museum who can join us tonight uh, with his wife Ruth. And Ruth, of course, has the additional distinction of being a member of the CNC design group from the 1970s and appears in a couple of the slides that we're showing here today. She's the one wearing the miniskirt. <laughs> <laughs> She's the good looking one. <laughs> Well, we better be careful what we say now. <laughs> um, also from the main Museum with, with us today are Ron Turley, Dave Casson, and Doug Cowie, uh, who are in the audience somewhere. Um, Ron and Dave, like myself, are uh, on the board of directors of the museum, and of course uh, Doug is the uh, long-suffering uh, uh, general manager of the museum. And talking about the museum, we were pleased that back in 2012, in conjunction with the Marine Museum, we were able to put on the CNC reunion and conference at Royal Hamilton Yacht Club uh, at a time when George could actively take part in it. And a number of the people here today uh, attended that event, uh, which was a two-day event, with the reunion on the Saturday and the conference on the uh, Sunday. And I know for a fact that George appreciated the good feelings uh, that were generated over those two days by all those lives he had influenced in the most positive ways. <clears throat> but I should also say that George, while George attended these events, uh, he, did, he didn't do it to flatter himself. I mean, uh, it was amazing. I, I, I put these reunions together in the Hall of Fame dinner and all this sort of stuff. And George, and then asked George to take, a, take part. And uh, he do it I honestly feel, uh, not for his own sake, but because we were going through the trouble of doing it, and it would have been churlish for him to say no. Uh, he did not, uh, he was probably the least egotistical person I've ever met. Uh, not to say he wasn't strong-willed. Nobody would doubt that he was strong-willed. Uh, but he was the least self-centered person I have ever met in my life. And that's why I think he'd be quite happy uh, with, with this gathering today of his many friends. Now, I mentioned that there would be a number of tributes uh, today, and uh, the amazing thing is that we received uh, a large number of written tributes by people who couldn't attend, either by, because of distance or age or uh, conflicts. And so what we will be doing today, uh, myself and Rob and Steve, is also reading some of these tributes from people uh, who had known uh, George for a long time. The first one I'm going to read is from uh, a cellmaker by the name of Charles Ulmer. Uh, most people you know him as Butch Ulmer. I always knew him as Charlie. Uh, I first met Charlie uh, when he invented the star cut spinnaker. And we brought him up here to put spinnakers on CNC 50s. And we had to put wire halyards on spinnaker halyards back then because the loads were so great. Um, I sailed with him on CRISPR Dragon and uh, in Bermuda races and CNC 40s all through Long Island Sound. Most of those sold by uh, Harry McMichael. Uh, and so uh, I, when, when Butch, Charlie, read about uh, George's passing, he wrote me a note and, was, and, it, and it said, it's my great privilege, it was my great privilege to meet and get to know George Cutterson, a.k.a. Big George, in the very early days of CNC and my early days in cell making. 
He had a formidable appearance due to his sheer size, but I can't recall him being a friendlier or down-to-earth person. He had a way of making everyone in his presence feel comfortable. With the growth of CNC, while the growth of CNC was uh, medi meteoric, uh, due to large part to his leadership, his remarkable success never affected George as a person. He was humble to a fault. Exclamation mark. As time passed, our personal meetings became less frequent, but each time we did meet, we picked right up where we left off. Forty odd years ago, my family grew by 40 percent when my wife gave birth to twin boys. A couple of weeks later. We received a package with two children's life jackets, <laughs> courtesy of George. One favorite photo of mine shows the boys with these life jackets on during a cruise in the BBI. I never look at that without thinking of George. I was saddened when I heard about his death. I can still picture his huge frame and friendly smile, and that image is indelible for me. Okay. Um, what I'd like to do next, I mentioned that I was not going to be speaking for the full hour, and the person I'd like to speak next is Doug Hunter. Uh, Doug and I put together an uh, introductory letter for the An Order of Canada nomination for George. This uh, nomination was headed up by Don Green, who was with us tonight, this afternoon as well, and included uh, myself, uh, Doug, and Mike Ballmer, who trying to put this together. We spent a lot of time writing this letter because we wanted to capture not only George's uh, influence on yacht design, but his influence on recreation in Canada. Uh, and I should mention that um, this was not the first nomination uh, of George for the Order of Canada. David Howard had put a nomination together prior to ours. We relied on a lot of the uh, input that uh, David put in, in our nomination. And despite these two nominations, of course, uh, George did not receive the Order of Canada because uh, we felt that uh, he wasn't chairman of the United Way or wasn't uh, involved in uh, a huge uh, hospital uh, function or anything like that. Uh, that's, and we were hopeful that he would this time because the person that had received the uh, Order of Canada just prior to that was Ian Bruce uh, for his... Uh, advancements in sailing. So we were quite confident that George would be uh, eligible as well. Um, but uh, Ian was nominated as co-designer of the laser, uh, if you remember, uh, a term which Bruce Kirby was not exactly happy with. <laughs> <laughs> and I should point out that Bruce Kirby never received the Order of Canada either. Um, but anyway, I'd like Doug to come up and say a few words uh, with regard to uh, what we put together Two years ago. Hello. Um, Forty-six years ago this month, um, George Hanerhorn started laying up a hall for a fairly newish design called the CNC 27. Uh, it was in November 1971, and it was hall number 93. And uh, that hall right now, I hope, is still under its tarp. Chattanooga Bay Sailing Club. Um, I bought the boat eight years ago, and it's it's my boat, the Diva. Um, when I got the boat, I told George that I finally owned a real boat, uh, which he was sort of pleasantly designed, delighted to hear. And uh, in my mind, if you owned a boat that was designed by Big George and Little George and was built by um, <coughs> by George Harrell, you really you really won the trifecta. Um, and I still uh, really feel that way. Um, I met George in 1981. I was 22, and I'd just written a book about a boat called Evergreen, which you may have of. It was called Against the Odds. And I interviewed a ton of people with that book. But for some reason, I never interviewed George. And after the book came out, George phoned me. And uh, he wanted to meet me and, and have lunch. And, uh, <clears throat> and as George told me, which I think I've told some of the people involved before, George told me he didn't like the boat. Um, but, but he liked the book. So, <laughs> one for the 22-year-old writer. Um, and he wanted me to write a history of CNC. He wanted me to write about 25,000 words, and I decided to swing for the fences, and I asked for $6,000. I wanted half of it up front, because, you know, boat builders, you know, so we're going to be in three months after all this work. And uh, there was this pause, 
And I, I think there's bleak Norwegian film noir scripts with shorter pauses than that. <laughs> and he finally said, I think we can keep talking. So, so we did. We kept talking. I agreed to do it. We kept talking for decades after that. We kept talking all through the time I was in the marine journalism racket and after that as well. And um, George to me was always one of those people in, in my profession where you really didn't want to let him down. That was, there's not many people like that you meet in your, in your job and your writing. And he always respected what I was doing. And, and I always thought I, could, I would say what I wanted about certain things. But occasionally there would be something I would write, and George would phone me up. And there was always that <coughs> kind of throat clearing and then sort of melodic baritone. Um, there's something maybe I think you need to know or understand. You know, <laughs> tell me about it. And I would take that. And I, I took it very seriously. I really wanted to know what, what, what George wanted to say. So a few years ago, I was asked to get involved with this order of can application. And, um, you know, I'm sorry we didn't pull it off. It's a mysterious process uh, to me. Um, we did what we could. And I think a lot of what we wrote in here is probably, we were writing for people that don't know that it was being a canoe paddle on a bowsprit, so um, I'm not sure I need to actually go through it all, but there are some important things that now, um, Rob sent me the copy, but I haven't looked at it in a while, um, but I'll try to hit the highlights here of what we talked about, and was for tens of thousands of recreational sailors in Canada and around the world, the label CNC is synonymous with speed, grace, comfort, longevity, and ingenuity. As a co-founder, original designer, and corporate president of CNC Yachts, George Ruth Cupperson was elemental to a remarkable Canadian success story that rapidly became a global nameplate for design and construction excellence. But for all the trophies, and there are, continues to be many, this was the time we were writing, that CNC celebrated racing designs garnered, the greatest legacy of which all Canadians should be proud is how George Cupperson completely transformed the recreational lives of Canadians. Quite simply, he put thousands of Canadian families on the water and he's kept us there. Before the company even existed, he was at the forefront internationally of making the environmentally friendly pastime of sailing affordable through mass production fiberglass. There were other players, but George was an exceptional designer. And with CNC, he gave the world sailboats so well built and so admired for their aesthetics, engineering, and performance that more than 40 years after some of them were launched, I'm living witness to that, they continue to offer middle class families the opportunity to harness the wind and sail away for an afternoon or weeks on end. He was fundamental to turning a pastime of elites into a passion of the masses. You visit any sailing club today in Canada and the United States and you'll find classic CNC designs and owners who would sail nothing else. And in sailing those CNCs, those owners, their spouses, their children have connected with Canada's maritime heritage and its natural environment like no generation before them. As George himself once pointed out, it all starts with the design, but as Eric Bruckman often said, it all started with George. It has often been said that successful sale of design is equal parts science and art, and CNC designs were successful because they contained ample quantities of both. CNC designs, most notably models and drawings of the famous CNC 61 Sorcery and Canada's Cup winning Manitou have been displayed in the Design Exchange in Toronto and other CNC designs, whether suspended from lifting straps or viewed through the open doors of a warehouse, as we've seen, um, have been the subjects of noted Canadian artist Christopher Pratt, himself a longtime CNC owner and devotee. George Cuthbertson's success is based on a sound background in engineering, a good business sense, and above all, an incredibly artistic eye. A CNC design has a unique look that is instantly recognizable. All of this led to the creation of a Canadian company that has been synonymous with quality in all its aspects, and is still recognized globally as a leader in sailboat design and production. George's legacy rests, was, uh, rests in part in mentoring many individuals who progressed through CNC and became leading figures in their own right in the North American boating industry. Foremost is the legacy of fine, enduring designs when originally built craft like the 25, 27, 30, 35, 39, opened the pastime of sailing to a broad group of Canadians and international clients. As these and other production models endure into their fourth and fifth decades, successive generations of new sailors and their families have found their way into the pastime through these designs. For many, a sailboat always has been and always will be a CNC. Thank you.
Thanks, Jack. Um, I should mention, actually, one reason we thought we had a, uh, not a shoe-in for the Order of Canada is that uh, Don Green, who was heading up our nomination, was also a recipient of the Order of Canada, I'm not sure I mentioned that. Uh, and, of course, uh, the fact that um, Ian Bruce had won it the year before. Anyway, um, the other thing, the other thing that we organized, uh, that George took a part in, again, on the grounds that uh, it was doing us a favor more than uh, bringing himself glory, uh, was that uh, he agreed to become the uh, co-honorary curator of the new Age of Sail exhibit at the Marine Museum back in 2014. The other uh, honorary curator was, of course, uh, Bruce Kirby. And then at a gala dinner, and the opening of that uh, exhibit, which uh, I think a uh, number of you were in, in attendance, uh, we inducted uh, both George and Bruce into the Canadian Sailing Hall of Fame. Uh, the Canadian Sailing Hall of Fame only had one other inductee at that time, and that was, of course, Paul Henderson. <laughs> And photos of both those functions, the, uh, the reunion and the Hall of Fame dinner, actually are in this uh, slideshow. And I asked David Howard uh, if he would be kind enough to read the induction speech that he made uh, in inducting George into the Hall of Fame in Kingston in 2014. And uh, I should just mention before David comes to the podium here, is that in my remarks, uh, just before David spoke, I referred to the 175-year history of sailing, yachting in Canada. And David, without missing a beat, got to the podium and said, Well, Rob, you've got to remember, I've personally lived more than half of those 175 years. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to call upon uh, David Howard uh, to uh, read the, uh, his uh, induction of George. I first would like to pay a compliment to Rob Nasa. Is there anybody in Canada who knew as much or even more than George Cuthbertson with the history of yachts and yachting in Canada? It would be Rob Nasa. I have a couple of things to say. One would be that I'm older than anybody else here. <laughs> the other might be that I knew George Cuthbertson longer than anybody else here. I've known George for 60, well, I, listen, I wrote this and spoke of it four years ago. I said, and I'll read what I wrote. I have known George Cuthbertson for 64 years. In 1950, he was a young, single, 21-year-old. He and Helen married about eight years later. It seems my wife Beth and I have been friends of George and Helen forever. I think George began his business career in partnership with Peter Davidson. George designed an eight-foot sailing dinghy, which they fabricated in the new wonder material fiberglass. George named it the Water Wrap. Using the then modern mass production techniques, they built and sold several score. There was a rumor abroad that they planned to erect a major plant to produce thousands. <clears throat> if there was such a plan, it was wrecked by a wonderful man named Norman Walsh. In 1956, he asked George to design and supervise the building of a 54-foot ocean racing yacht. This was the remarkable yacht in the Shree, a great performer and a thing of beauty. Innish Free was George's first major yacht. He was not known then as a yacht designer. In truth, he was hardly known at all. 
even some of the shipmates didn't know his name. Innis Free entered the 1962 Newport to Bermuda race. There were ten in the crew, including George, myself, and Graham Craig, who was both navigator and ship's doctor. George, off watch, was asleep in an upper bunk. He awoke with a start, sat up in the dark, and split his forehead open on the deck head. I woke Graham Craig, ship's doctor, and said, Get up! George is injured. Graham said, George? George who? <laughs> George has come a long way. In 25 years, he earned the reputation as Canada's greatest ever designer builder of racing yachts. I have been a lucky participant in many of his creations as owner, part owner, or crew member. Beth, my wife, claims she grew first blood as owner in 1965. George telephoned, Beth answered the phone, to say that George Hinterhomer was building a wooden plug from which to produce a mold to manufacture a line of 35-foot fiberglass sloops. The plug could be turned into a yacht. Would we consider buying the plug slash yacht. Beth said instantly, we'll take it. Banked in mahogany with a piano finish, she was in our eyes the most beautiful yacht in the world. Named Invader 3, she was the first of George's Invader class. I was a member of the crew in a dozen Cuthbertson yachts that followed. Every one was a joy George and I were shipmates in many of them. Cuthbertsons and Howards have been dear friends through all these years. I'm delighted at this group four years ago. I'm delighted to be here with many of your friends, George, and admirers to see you, George, so honored. Thank you. a number of uh, written uh, tributes to George, and uh, we referred to Bruce Kirby earlier as being uh, his um, uh, co-inductee into the Canadian Sailing Hall of Fame, so Bruce uh, did not hesitate to drop me a note, and I'd like to read it uh, now. It's uh, somewhat lengthy, but I think it uh, describes some, in, in, some commonalities in their uh, careers that are worth talking about. Uh, Bruce says, uh, George and I met at a CDA 14 regatta at RCYC in the early 50s when he was chief measurer. Actually, he was chief measurer at RCYC when he was 17 years old, uh, and I was a competitor. Uh, when most of his design began racing in the Southern Ocean Racing Circuit in the 1960s, George was kind enough to arrange for me to be invited along on his creations. One of the first races we sailed was the Lipton Cup Day Race off Miami in 1968 aboard Electra, one of the early Belleville Marine Corvettes. I should say I own a Corvette myself. Uh, aboard, in addition to the boat owner, Gordon Stonehouse, were Big George, Ian Morch, builder of the Corvette, uh, George Henner Fuller, and myself, who says referring to himself. And incidentally, I should point out that uh, with George Cuthbertson, uh, Ian Morch, and George Henner on the same boat, most people attribute that, that series to the creation of C and C yachts. But um, Bruce continues. Uh, we were in class F for the smallest boats, and we figured that a new and well sailed Spartan and Stevens 34 footer would be our chief competition. In fact, Electra won her class that day by a comfortable margin. And a week later, scored second overall in the 135 foot boat. Miami Nassau Classic. In the final race of that series, the Nassau Cup race, Electra did, did well but did not win. And in any case, our crew was distracted by watching Red Jacket, two classes ahead, clinch the overhaul, overall SORC title. 
It was a great day and a great year for George Kalkinson. And Bruce goes on, a personal look into the generosity of George came when I was asked to design an IOR quarter tonner in 1972. At this time, I had never designed a keel boat. I struggled through the design process and got the boat looking the way I wanted, and then faced the horrible task of making sure it rated under the IOR designation of a quarter ton. Everything went fine until I came to the initials RM. And Bruce assures me that's not Rob Mazza, that's writing moments. <laughs> and uh, which is a measure of the boat's stability. I was not an engineer and certainly not a mathematician. I was a bloody journalist. So I called Big George and he tried to teach me about writing moments. After a few minutes, he realized he was not really getting through and said, uh, look, I'll send you two or three IOR, IOR certificates from some of our boats that are about the same size as the one you're designing. These certificates indicated that my boat had normal stability uh, for its size. You know, a huge sigh of relief, says uh, Bruce. My quarter tonner became the San Juan 24 and remains my second most successful design in the, in, to, us, to this day in terms of numbers built. George was a special kind of guy and a very generous friend. Now we talked about yacht design as an art and as most successful artists have found, it really does pay off to have a loyal supporter, a patron. And most yacht designers also function under the auspices of patrons. And there was no greater patron of the art of yacht design than Gordon Fisher. He truly was a, a patron of the art with the uh, building of Lamouette, Thermopylae, Manitou and Mirage, Mary Thought, Terrier, and then that other boat that he was involved in, the non such, uh, with another designer. Uh, I'd like, therefore, to ask Derek Fisher to say a few words, and perhaps entertain us with uh, some home movies. Uh, Derek? Thanks, Rob. Keep talking for a couple minutes while I set this up. Okay, well, Derek's setting that up. I'm going to read another tribute. <laughs> uh, as most of you know, I'm involved in a little magazine called uh, Good Old Boat. And when Karen Larson uh, heard of uh, George's passing, she too wanted to say a few words. And uh, her tribute reads, this is from Karen and Jerry uh, Polis. Uh, Karen Larson and Jerry Polis. And this is a different Karen Larson, by the way, that uh, a lot of us know. Uh, and actually, Karen uh, told a story, which I'm not going to repeat, about uh, the other Karen Larson that Helen knew as well. <laughs> but, um, I won't go uh, we're thrilled, this is Karen saying, we were thrilled a few years ago after the launch of our good old boat magazine to receive a note from George Cuthbertson in Capital. This is worthy of a big wow. You understand, this is the man who created our CNC 30 and many other sister ships. George had read in our newsletter that we'd be sailing Mystic from our normal cruising grounds at Lake Superior to Lake Huron's northern channel, North Channel. He wanted to meet us. We were as excited as any rock star fans might be. That summer, George, Helen, and their golden retriever did stop by uh, to visit us in Spanish Ontario with a granddaughter in tow. Is that one of you? <laughs> <laughs> and they, uh, who they were delivering to summer camp. Uh, we cleaned Mystic from stem to stern. She was going to be her maker, we said. We wanted to show him how we were taking care of one of George's creations. But George had seen plenty of CNC produced in his time. He was more interested in, in the people who started the magazine about classic fiberglass elbows, including CNC produced. Slightly starstruck, we sat in the cockpit together and enjoyed our brief time with C number one of CNC. After that, we received occasional nice notes or email messages from George, who was always a gentleman. And we were delighted to think of him as a friend and know he was a reader of Good Old Boat magazine and the accompanying newsletter. The world is diminished now that George II has gone to be his maker. How are we doing? So we can get this to display on the screen. What right. <laughs> Derek put me on to, uh, and what he's trying to put together now, were two videos uh, that appear on YouTube. Uh, and uh, they're exceptional. 
uh, historic documents. Because one is the launching of Lama West in 1961, I believe. And the other is the launching of uh, Thermopylae in 1964, 65. And we've got the high price help here. <laughs> One of the other people who was actually supposed to speak with us, speak uh, for us today, was John Byrne. John Byrne has probably known George Cutterson professionally uh, more than, longer than any of us in this room. Uh, John started with George in 1965 out of uh, uh, Grampian Marine. John is an exceptional individual because he actually pioneered fiberglass boat building in Canada. Um, it was when uh, Grampian wanted to get into boat building, they sent him down to uh, to uh, tutor, to uh, apprentice, I guess the term, with uh, Bill Dyer at the Anchorage in, uh, in Rhode Island. And uh, he brought back a year's full of knowledge to Grampian Marine and got them into fiberglass boat building. So when I asked uh, if John, if he wanted to say a few words, he wrote them out in a long hand, which I can almost decipher. Uh, he couldn't join us today because his knees are acting up and he was very wobbly this morning when I was talking to him. Uh, he picked up these notes. And he says, thank you, I was building, thank you, <laughs> I was building uh, fiberglass yachts in Oakville in 1965. George came to investigate and invited me to join Cups and Cassian as fiberglass expert and yacht broker. And actually in one of these slides there's a shot of a brochure with John in it. Uh, as Sparkman and Stevens, uh, eminent designers, uh, were known as S&S, &S, uh, I paraphrase that uh, Captain Macassian into C and C yachts. Some of this isn't entirely accurate, by the way. <laughs> 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 a caveat. Uh, because he goes on to say, Perry Connolly designed a, a Canada's Cup boat, which he didn't, uh, and I couldn't, uh, this is referring to Red Jacket, and I convinced George the glass uh, had to be the only way to go, not strip plank wood. And I should point out that that, that is probably true because uh, Eric Bruckman had only built strip plank wood boats, including Lamoet and Thermopylae. And when he was asked to build um, Red Jacket, he knew absolutely nothing about fiberglass. And so uh, John goes on, George, uh, George rightly said, uh, we, we'd have no time to build a fiberglass boat uh, because we'd have to build a mold and do all that stuff. And, uh, and then John says, uh, I said we will build her one-off uh, without a mold <coughs> using balsa core and doing it inside out, so to speak. We had two other custom designs, uh, Inferno and, uh, for Jim McHugh and, and from Chicago and Xanadu uh, for Ewart Steichman of Montreal. Actually, Mike Dale, who was with us today, did most of the drawings on the Sanadu, we found out. Um, to my great fortune, Eric, who has been, who had been trained at Aberkane and Rasmussen in Germany, now that is false. <laughs> <laughs> because Eric had uh, no formal boat building training at all before it came to Canada. Um, oh yeah, so Eric, Eric Buckman took to it took to the concept of being 10 times smarter than me. We built all three that way, uh, and CNC was launched. I kept in touch with George and Helen uh, in their retirement village in Burlington uh, for lunch or coffee, and uh, when they moved to the city uh, to be close to family, uh, I lost touch somewhat. But George always kept in touch, uh, and this is the interesting line talking about the Order of Canada. He says, if in England, he would have been knighted. <laughs> Are we close? Oh, I, I think this is going to work. Okay. Thank you, Rob. Don't trip over the wires and come this way.
So Dad was a, uh, a huge fan of George's, and uh, his, uh, you know, I'm not sure whether he liked building boats or sailing them more, but he certainly built enough of them between Lamouette, Thermopylae, Manitou, don't forget Isle of Skye. I believe Isle of Skye is the only power yacht that CNC ever did. Uh, um, the uh, Terrier, and uh, thanks to Steve Killing, was a CNC yacht. Um, you know, even the non-such was uh, Mark Ellis Design, uh, an alumni of, uh, of, uh, of CNC. So really, all of Dad's boats had a CNC thread to them. Now, what I've got here is uh, a family movie, if you'll indulge me. Uh, so this is the launching of Lamouette in 1961. It's a bit shaky, uh, but if you look closely, there are pictures of George, Eric Brookman. Um, I, I think I've seen uh, Paul Esten there, John Rothwell, uh, and various other people uh, in there. Now, you know, what's interesting about this is, I'm just going to start, there's no sound, so I don't have to... What's interesting, launching a boat back then was a big deal. You know, this was a ceremony. There were lots of people around. Uh, and, uh, and I can imagine that a wooden boat built over a, uh, a winter was uh, a work of art. And uh, so everybody came out. You know, all the, the, uh, the, the staff, the workers at Metro Marine, you know, they were there. Uh, you'll see in a minute that they were all given a uh, silver, I guess it's a, a Burke's beer mug. And everybody was celebrating with, with their beer mug. Uh, and um, uh, the, um, for me, you know, as a youngster, and I'm in there somewhere, uh, that's, uh, there's Dad with the sweater on. Uh, and I think that's John Rothwell up on top there in the white. Um, for me, I loved going out to Metro Marine on a Saturday morning. The smell of the wood and the glue is still in my mind. Uh, crawling through the boats. Uh, you know, what was interesting is both Lamouette and uh, Dad's successor to Lamouette, Thermopylae, were built inside out. They, they built the framing, they built the interior, and then they, they put the planking on. So for me, as a, a young kid, to be able to climb into the boat through the sides and then see where my berth was going to be uh, was just fantastic. The, um, uh, so the, you know, going out with my father, uh, I wasn't part of the meetings, but George was there, Eric Brookman, and uh, being part of that, uh, I think that's what started the, uh, the love of sailing in my life. The building of the boats, uh, for me, was just as much uh, of interest as the, the sailing of them. And luckily, Dad went through uh, a number of, of boats and uh, you know, really got the thing. Now, the two boats, Thermopylae and Lambouette, were both wooden, but uh, by the time Manitou came along, which was really a, an offshoot of a red jacket, fiberglass was the thing. So the, the, the for me, the smells changed a little bit. bit. Instead of wood, it was the, the smell of fiberglass. But then, you know, but I can go into uh, you know a boat building operation uh, now, and it just it brings back the memories. It's just it's fantastic. So here she is being launched. Uh, a marine railway. You know, no cranes, no uh, uh, travel lifts. So I think that's much more majestic. You know, people, you know, who goes to a boat launching these days? You know, not many. The pomp and circumstance, the flags on the top. I don't know what the flags spell out, if anything, but... Uh, yes, Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> A high-tech workbook. <laughs> the 
But all of this, because George was a great designer, and uh, and Dad, who lucky luckily enough had the resources, he wanted the best designer for his boats, and uh, and he was very lucky to have George right next door, uh, you know, Toronto Port Credit. You could drive there in half an hour, and uh, it was a, uh, you know, a, a very synergistic relationship. You know, they both enjoyed each other's company, uh, and they produced, uh, from my point of view, some of the most beautiful boats. I think Thermopylae uh, was just a spectacular-looking boat, and uh, uh, I don't know what's happened to her, but Lamouette actually is still afloat. She's in Annapolis. And uh, if these, uh, these videos I had put up on YouTube and made them public. And about six months after I put this one up, I got an email from a gentleman in Annapolis and said, I own that boat. <laughs> and uh, he sent me some pictures. She's in great shape. And I have a standing invitation to go down and go for a sail on her. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, a boat that was built uh, in over the winter in 1960 uh, is still being enjoyed and sailing uh, down in the heartland of uh, American sailing. So, so I enjoyed the boats. They, uh, they were a lot of fun. And that's mom with the, uh, the Jackie Onassis hood on. <laughs> so John Rothwell, have you recognized yourself in there yet? <laughs> So a different era, but uh, great memories. So uh, to the Cuthbertson family, thank you so much. Thank you, Derek. Uh, the Metro Marine actually was an incredible incubator of boat building. I mean, it existed uh, for about, well, it existed a long time, actually, but as a boat building enterprise. It existed for about uh, maybe six to eight years. And the amount of talent that came out of that operation was uh, incredible. Eric Bruckman came out of Metro Marine, of course, and with him he brought uh, Horace Manzel and Brian Jorgensen, uh, who formed the back uh, bone of CNC Custom. Uh, Vic Carpenter, who used to work at uh, Metro Marine, actually took over the uh, shop superintendent position when Eric left. And Miku Jean uh, used to work at Metro Marine. Uh, that's where he, he learned basically how to glue wooden boats together. Uh, it was an incredible operation, there should, uh, and that building fortunately has been preserved uh, by the city of Oakville, and there should be a historic plaque right up front of it, because the uh, uh, Canadian boat building business basically originated from Metro Marine. Uh, the, um, I mentioned the number of people who uh, uh, owe their design careers to George Cutterson, or you know, their careers in boat building, and uh, got designed to George Cutterson. And I want to next ask Rob Ball if I can come up and say a few words. Rob started that, um, at the design office, I think the year before I did. Uh, and that's when it was on 10 Front Street South in Port Credit, and it was still uh, Cutterson and Cassian. He, uh, when George decided to take over the presidency in 1973, he handed design responsibilities to Rob, who uh, held that position until 1996, uh, through several Variations of things he has. <laughs> so I hand the uh, mic over to Rob. Do you want to handle it? <laughs> I'm afraid I have a frog in my throat, so you'll have to bear with me. Most of us here, though, have had good experiences with Big George, and certainly I'm a champion among those. I managed to talk the two Georges into a summer job back in 1968, and they agreed to have me back after my naval architecture degree at the University of Michigan. However, that degree didn't help very much in yacht design. I think I had one hour lecture on small boats in five years at that school. 
George had me designing masks, masks and mask fittings fairly quickly.